This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today on the show, we'll welcome back Emma Rhodes, co-founder and director of conservation and scientific research at the Banding Coalition of the Americas. She's a truly dedicated avian researcher and outreacher. As a master bird bander, she'll talk with us today about the Purple Martin Project and how regular citizens can participate in bird banding activities. Also, Dr. Major and Libby are ready to answer pet and creature questions. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. And if you missed the Creature Comforts broadcast on Thursday, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning. Let's uh, start with our West Coast update from Libby. Libby, what are you seeing out there in Oregon? Good morning, Kevin. Good morning. Uh, This morning I have Anna's hummingbirds on my trumpet vine. And I'd like to think if I were home in Mississippi, I would have um, ruby-throated hummingbirds on my trumpet vine. So I feel right at home with that. I've got a black capped chickadees as opposed to our little um, birds that we have in the east and have scrub jays and haven't seen California quail this morning but I saw some yesterday while I was walking. A red-breasted nuthatch which I would have at home also. So um, it's a, a birding day not unlike at home. I've not seen purple martins here, Emma, but I know there is a nesting colony just a few miles north of me in an area that I, I do like to walk in, so I'll continue to look for those. They're um, a little more rare here than they are in Mississippi, so um, not as likely to see them, but we do live in one part of Oregon that does have them. They're in the coastal mountains and um, in the Willamette Valley, and we're here in the valley. So it's a a beautiful day, uh, about, let's see, 54 degrees, I think, right now. Hmm. So I don't know. We we don't have the heat wave now. We may get <laughs> later in the summer, though. Huh? Looks like it's going to hit all of us before it's over. Yeah, I so heard the uh, weather before we came on, and uh, heat indexes of over 110, I believe, and then. Uh, out west, saw that Phoenix is in some ungoshly long period of over 110 degrees, I think it was. So good that you're getting so little more uh, temperate weather. So uh, enjoy that uh, cool weather while you have it uh, yeah. out there. And we, we, uh, here in Corvallis, it may hit 90 today. Okay. It'll be in the high 80s at least. But it, so far, we're, we get that cool evening kind of late in the evening, 9, 10 o'clock, it really cools down, and so we have a nice, cool morning. And, I, you know, I imagine that's great for the birds. It's got to help. That We've had only a small sprinkle for the last month, though, so it's very dry. I'm uh, off to visit my mother in New York uh, next week, and I was looking at the head at the weather, and it looks like uh, the highs will be in the 70s if I read the weather, weather forecast correctly. So I'm going to enjoy a little bit of a break from this heat as well. So that should be uh, a, a fun trip, hopefully, or at least a cool trip, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, enjoy that. That's going to be worth it. Uh, Dr. Major is joining us from his clinic in Jackson, as he usually does during the show. So, Dr. Major, got an email here for you, and then I got an email that uh, both you and Libby can uh, comment on. But this first one says, My five-year-old Jack Russell has severe plaque buildup on her teeth. What would you recommend to remedy <laughs> scaling or another method and then what about prevention? You know, this is a great question. And I would, I would imagine that a large percentage of our middle-aged to older dogs do have a buildup of plaque. And plaque really is uh, 
one of the things that causes gum recession, in other words, the gum will recede, exposing uh, the non-enamel root, and can cause some very serious decay. Uh, I would, if it's really built up, I would suggest that you have your veterinarian uh, actually uh, scale the teeth and get this plaque off uh, and treat the ones that need to be treated. A lot of dogs will let you actually uh, brush their teeth, maybe not every day, but uh, a small um, infant-type brush, one that's soft is good. Uh, you can also use gauze sponges and massage the gums. That alone will help prevent a lot of the tartar buildup. Now, there are a lot of other things that are given or eaten that, uh, that seem to help. Uh, one of the popular ones is the greenie. Uh, some people love those. Some dogs love them. Uh, things that they can chew on. But not every dog will lose a tartar or plaque just because it's chewing on something hard or uh, something that's designed to do that. But there are various things that you can use. Talk to your veterinarian about that, what you can do to help prevent the buildup of tartar again uh, once, once you've had them cleaned. So what is scaling? Scaling basically would be the same thing that we probably would have on your teeth using an ultrasonic tooth scaler. Uh, to remove that plaque, and uh, it, it does very. You can do some with mechanical instruments. Uh, by mechanical, I'm saying that there are things called scalers that you can uh, actually pop this tartar off. But we use an uh, ultrasonic scaler, uh, and, it, and it works real well. All right, we've got a, another email here, and as I said, uh, Dr. Major, I'd like your opinion, and then Libby, if you have some thoughts on this as well, because it's kind of a, a number of questions about raccoons. So it says, raccoons come onto our porch to drink from our cat's water bowl. Can they transmit any diseases to our cats in this way? Let's uh, start with that one, uh, Dr. Major. You know, obviously the raccoons need some water as dry as it is and everything. Things really dry up quickly. I notice I'm having to fill my bird water every day uh, because the sun and everything just dries it out so quickly, but it, uh, also the birds will uh, take partake of that. I would prefer, if you can, not to have a water source there on the porch where the cats get their water uh, because, yes, they can spread disease. Uh, one of the more common ones is leptospirosis, which is a disease that can affect actually affects uh, our animals, but also can affect humans. Uh, and they also, uh, you know, a possibility of carrying rabies. Not that we have uh, cases of that reported here in Mississippi at present, but certainly they can carry you know, certain diseases that uh, can affect the cats and dogs and potentially people. All right, uh, the next one says, one raccoon fought with one of our cats. Can our cat get any dangerous infections or diseases from a raccoon bite? And, Dr. Major, I would guess that if, if your cat is bitten by something, raccoon or something else, that would be an immediate uh, trip to the vet and maybe even one of those after-hour clinics if need be. You know, certainly a, a raccoon bite is, is pretty vicious. Uh, they can, raccoons can hold their own especially depending on the size of the raccoon and a dog. But, you know, a lot of raccoons are, can inflict a, a very serious bite and uh, certainly could kill a cat if they chose to do so or if that confrontation went on. But, yes, they, they can spread disease just like we mentioned before. But a bite like that can be very serious and life-threatening. All right, two raccoons have come into the house to eat the cat's food. One walked right by me and touched my clothes. What can people get disease-wise from raccoons? Well, we just mentioned the potential of leptospirosis, and that is spread through the urine primarily, uh, and certainly could be an issue. I don't think the raccoon touching your clothes, brushing by. But again, this is a serious thing. The raccoons can do a lot of damage in the house. If you've got a a pet door uh, that uh, gives free access and there's food. And I'm sure if you go on YouTube or Facebook, whatever, you can see some of the damage that raccoons have done in the house. Uh, I would say that they could pretty well wreck uh, everything searching for food. 
But no, I would fix it where the raccoons could not come into my house. All right, and Libby, I'd like your thoughts on this one. The, the final question was, you know, what other information should I know about the dangers of living close to raccoons? How do you live in peace with them and enjoy them without pets or humans getting sick? Yeah, that's exactly the goal we want. You want to be able to see your wildlife without um, without fear that you're going to have a problem with them, or that you're going to cause a problem for the wildlife, too, I guess. But um, the number one deal is just... Do not feed wild mammals. And that's hard for some people, I know, because if you get in the habit of doing it particularly, you know that's a way to lure them closer where you can get a picture and, you know, it, one thing leads to another. And then, like this collar, you can get one in the house, and that's that's pretty bad. Um, I have seen damage done by raccoons in a home, and it was pretty um awful i mean shredded furniture and all kinds of stuff if they get too comfortable in there um it can be bad but the main thing is you want them to stay you know kind of at a distance from where you're going to be interacting with your you know your children and your pets so the number one thing is don't feed them if you have a garden that they want to frequent it um it's a good idea to uh, find ways to fence well enough to keep them out so that you're not luring them too close with your garden either. If they love corn, we've had um, problems with our corn garden. Um, raccoons will come in. They, they know to watch until it gets ripe, and then just as the corn gets, uh, generally, as we say, a day or two before we're ready to pick it, the coons, if they get a chance, will get in and knock all the um, stalks down and then eat what they want and, you know, ruin the rest. So, again, just don't feed them and find ways to make barriers or separations between your pets and your children and your food. One other point, I was a friend of mine posted on Facebook. It was a picture, I guess, probably with a trail camera type thing, but it was a picture of a raccoon I think probably on maybe some sort of fence stretching over to reach to where a bird feeder was. And it was the funny because it's the raccoon has that look on its face like, oh, oh, I've been caught or whatever. But these are very clever animals. So uh, as Libby said, kind of s uh, create a barrier between your part of the yard or that sort of thing and, and the uh, and the raccoons. So, yeah, I, I don't have this problem with the feeders in my yard. So I haven't done anything about it, but I have friends that just routinely pick up their bird feeders and, you know, take them into the back of their house each evening and then put them back out in the morning. So if you've got a problem like that with squirrels, sometimes flying squirrels can really hit a feeder hard. And um, so just be careful with that. Our guest for the hour is Emma Rhodes, co-founder and director of conservation and scientific research at the Banding Coalition of the Americas. We'll begin our discussion with her in just a minute, but as promised, Donna had called in and is holding for us. So, Donna, you are on the air, so go ahead, please. Good morning, all. Uh, we had an incident here in Natchez where birds were attacking our bedroom window, and we're not sure why. Eventually, they stopped. So that was very odd. Or Libby, maybe uh, you've had this actual experience, I think, in, in your yard. So what would you suggest for Donna to try to help alleviate the problem? I'm sorry, but you're going to have to repeat that. I couldn't hear what Donna was saying. Uh, it's an issue with birds running into their windows. Oh, yes. And uh, Emma may want to address that further, but um, I've purchased decals to put on the windows where I'm having the most problem and sometimes it's an issue with how far away from the window your feeders and uh, water it, uh, water sources for your birds are so um, you might do a little online reading about that or Emma might can tell us more about it but I know if the feeder is too close to a window it's easy for them to you know pop up and fly right into that window and big windows particularly look like an open area, a place for birds to fly. So anything you can do to break up that area so they're aware that there's something there in a, any kind of a decal that you put on there. You can do MPV stickers on your window if you want. <laughs> but uh, 
something like that will help. And I want to hear what Emma has to say, too. Um, yes, so um, I uh, just heard some of that. But, um, yeah, so I've actually come across this where we had um, my partner and I had uh, a pair of bluebirds in the yard um, in coastal Alabama. And the female would incessantly um, hit, well, not hit the window, as, as in not a window strike, but would constantly be fighting at the window. And, you know, we were like, well, what's going on? And so essentially what it is is that um, unlike window strikes where they don't see the window and they think that it's habitat or that they don't understand that there's a barrier there, they, they see um, their reflection and it's a threat. So particularly in the breeding season, um male and female birds you know don't really want to um, deal with another pair in their territory and so with this female bluebird we found that actually putting an object in front of the window seemed to help so like we put a couple different things in front and so she she seemed to uh be fighting with her reflection less because of that but yeah, we hear a lot of reports about this, and it's particularly during um, the time where birds are breeding. And you can try, you know, window decals, you can try putting an object in front. Um, unfortunately, you know, some birds are just really um, not willing to let that quote unquote other bird be in their territory. But that would be what I would advise to try. All right. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't understand that Donna's problem was a bird that was just attacking the the reflection. But what we did to stop that problem on our windows was put window screens up, just a real old, you know, an old fashioned screen on the window. Even for windows that we're not going to open now, we have a screen over them, and that solved it for us. For one thing, even if they see a little bit of a reflection, they hit that screen and it, it has a lot of give to it. So it, it doesn't hurt them. And, and Libby, didn't you also, when you had an issue, put a, a mirror up in a tree to maybe give them something else to distract them and not at the windows? For the mockingbird, who was just incessant with it, he and he ended up with two mirrors, and that finally did the trick. He played with the mirrors, and they were movable. They just were very small mirrors that that swung by in the uh, trees, the two trees that he liked to perch in the most. We put those there, and he then it just kind of became a game for him. He would bat at the mirrors, but you know, and even seemed like he was talking to them sometimes. Okay. Kevin Farrell here on Creature Comforts with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest for this hour is Emma Rhodes with the Banding Coalition of the Americas. You know, if you missed any of today's show, you can always subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app, or maybe you would like to download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone. That way you get to listen to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. So, Emma, the last time you were with us was last August, and you were trying to ban a rufous hummingbird not far from our studio. So is summer a busy time for bird banders? Um, great. Well, it's great to be back, Kevin, and I'm so glad to join um, you all this morning. Um, so I think that really depends on um, what you're banding and what the goals of your research are. So with hummingbirds... We typically ban a lot of hummingbirds during migration and in the winter months. It's not as common for us to get like Rufus hummingbird reports as early as July and August. Occasionally we do. Um, and so in the summer, it's busy if you have um, a breeding bird um, project. And so if you're banding any birds that are breeding, uh, like Purple Martins in May and June, um, along the Gulf Coast, and that, that is a busy time in particular for us. So when it comes to bird banding, wh why do we do it? What are the benefits, what are the information that you can learn from uh, bird banding? Yeah, so first of all, bird banding requires both federal and state permitting. Um, it's a highly regulated process because these birds are protected um, through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, so you can't just 
go out and um, trap birds without the proper permits. Um, the bird banning has been used um, as a conservation and research tool for many decades, and we're able to accrue important information about where birds migrate, important habitat um, information, as well as how well they're doing. So we can survey the birds um, through bird banding and figure out you know, how many young are being produced and surviving into adulthood? Are population stable? Um, this by no means is a comprehensive list, but that's a few examples of how you can use bird banding. And the technology must really be amazing because as you were, we were talking just a minute ago about banning a hummingbird and we all know how small that is. So what, what size do we think of when we th talk about bird banding and, and the little, is it like a GPS unit or something that's banded to them? Well, so um, bird banding, um, when it comes down to the basics, it's essentially putting a small, lightweight aluminum band, or typically aluminum, stainless steel for, for certain species. And that band has um, essentially a list of numbers. So you can think of it like a social security number for that bird. So with hummingbirds, that is the smallest bird that we ban. Um, so you can imagine the band is very small. And um, for most birds, we actually have nine digits on the band, but for the hummingbird, it's so small that we have a letter and then five numbers. So that is essentially how we can give a bird a unique identifier. Now, from there, um, you are absolutely right about technology. Um, it has advanced since um, the start of bird banding. And so I'm really grateful to be a part of this movement of integrating technology with banding. And that's something that we think is really important as BCA. And so we're starting to implement things like using GPS trackers, geolocators, um, we can also use something called automated telemetry to put small lightweight devices on birds. Now the technology um, is just now coming out to be able to track hummingbirds um, to this degree um, because again, you don't want the device to be, um, it, it can't weigh but so much of the bird's total body weight because we don't want to you know, harm them in any, in any way. And so this is highly regulated um, to make sure that we're, you know, using something that won't affect the bird's daily life. Um, but we're really excited to be using some of this technology um, right now as BCA. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today with Emma Rhodes, the co-founder and director of conservation and scientific research at the Banding Coalition of the Americas. So, Emma, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, purple martins, and let's begin by covering the basics for folks that might not know about the purple martin. Uh, first, describe what they look like. So, the purple martin, I would say, is um, about the size of a mockingbird, and they are the shimmery, um, you know, they're not really purple is, is the funny thing uh, about it. Um, they're kind of a, a shimmery, dark um, blue, depending on how the sun um, hits them. Their wings are black, and they have these black, um, wide bills. Um, and so um, these purple martins, um, especially in the eastern U.S., are more prominent than out west, um, as Libby mentioned. Um, but, yeah, that's just a general description of how I would describe um, how they look. Uh, can they be found in all parts of the country? So, um, as we mentioned, in the eastern U.S., they are more, um, they, they have uh, increased numbers as, as opposed to western U.S. So you can see them out west, but they're not as common. Um, and that's partly due to the eastern and the re western races having different behaviors. So the eastern U.S., um, or the the eastern purple martin race has adapted to humans and so they're actually reliant um, almost completely and entirely on artificial um, human-made houses like gourds and houses the western u.s uh, population still um, nest in natural cavities and of course these birds um, don't uh, only belong to the U.S. They actually spend a huge amount of time 
in the tropics. Um, and so they go to particularly Brazil in the winter and uh, they spend a lot of time down there when they're not breeding um, in North America. We uh, focused on the Purple Martin because you are involved with the Southeastern Purple Martin Project. So if you would tell us what that is. So this is a project that um, we started as Banning Coalition of the Americas. Essentially, we started it because um, we had some landlords, Purple Martin landlords, which are people who provide housing for Martins and act actively manage the colony. And they reached out and they asked um, a couple years back if we would come and ban their Martins because they were interested to know, you know, was um, were the same birds returning every year or not. And we started researching um, and looking at, well, what has been done in the Southeast? And not a lot of um, not a lot of work has been done with the Southeastern Purple Martin um Purple Martin populations. Um, a lot of research has focused up in the Northeast, um, but there's these areas that um, really there are data gaps. And so we decided to start this project working alongside landlords in the Southeast um, to ban their Martins and to figure out, you know, where they're migrating to um, and what, what are these important habitats um, that they need off season, off breeding season, um, in order for us to conserve the species. So uh, what are some of the current threats that uh, purple martin populations face? So um, uh, some of the main threats include things like um, invasive species, um, such as the uh, European starling and the house sparrow. So purple martins have this interesting um, interaction with them where around in the 1800s, um, these two species we see emerging in North America, and of course they were introduced, they're not natural. And um, in, in their non-native habitat, these species can cause active harm to our native species, and they are really ultra aggressive with the way they've adapted um, to these new habitats and fight for cavities. And so um, we can see that artificial houses were provided to Purple Martins as early as um, with the indigenous peoples. And so we have records of that, why they really did provided houses for purple martins uh, via gourds. We're not really sure, maybe it was insect to keep insect populations down. But then once these two species start emerging, what happens is now um, the purple martins no longer have suitable habitat due to habitat destruction as well as uh, the confounding effect of these um, these non-native species actively competing with them. And so this is one of the primary issues um, that they're currently facing is, is competition with these non-native species as well as um, overall habitat destruction and habitat loss. You're listening to Creature listening Comforts to on MPB Think Radio and are visiting today with Emma Rhodes, the co-founder and director of conservation and scientific research at the Banding Coalition of the Americas. So when we were talking about bird banding a little bit earlier, you mentioned uh, geolocators. Again, if you would kind of tell us what that is and how it helps in the study of purple martins. So geolocators are this lightweight device that um, essentially we can deploy on martins and they wear it like a little backpack. So it weighs 3% or less of the bird's overall body weight. So it doesn't hurt them. And this unit collects um, light information uh, for a year. And so we deploy the unit and it's collecting light information. And the idea is that we hope to see that bird back at that same site the following year. We're able to retrieve that unit. And this light information can be transformed into location information. And so we can estimate where these birds have been, where they overwintered, and how they returned back to their breeding grounds. And um, this is really interesting because we see that different populations have different strategies to get to Brazil. Some fly over land, some fly over water. And so ultimately we wanted to understand what was going on there. And so, um, yeah, we deploy these units to try to get a picture of how they're migrating. So, Emma, we talk a lot about citizen science projects on this program. Is there a way that people can get involved and help out in this Purple Martin project? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, the eastern purple orange race is really reliant on uh, on humans. And so in many cases, without um, our, our help, um, they would be in real trouble. And so people um, help in, in many different ways. Some people might consider becoming a Purple Martin landlord. Now, Purple Martins are aerial insectivores, and I kind of like describing them as like little planes. And so just like a plane, they need a runway. And so unfortunately, not every, every yard is going to attract a Purple Martin. You really need open area uh, for them to take off and to forage on these insects on the wing. But you might consider becoming a Purple Martin landlord, and if you reach out to us, we can provide you with more information. Um, you can also um, visit where Purple Martins are, are at during the breeding and the migration and look for color bands and report them to us. So we also have been uh, color banding hundreds of Purple Martins to try to figure out where the young in particular of, from these colonies that we're studying, where they go to and are they surviving um, and dispersing. So you could help that way, um, you know, and you can help um, spread awareness about how, you know, they're reliant on us and, um, and how these invasive species, you know, are harming them. And so these are just a few ways um, you might consider um, participating. Uh, tell us a bit more about the different colored bands, as though is it to, to, to easily locate where a bird might have originated from? Yeah, so the idea is that um, it's more of a filled readable band. So the standard um, aluminum band, like I was talking about earlier, that's essentially like the social security number for that bird. It's not really filled readable. You can see the band on the bird's leg, but it's extremely difficult to read the numbers. And so we color band them with alphanumerics. And so they have a state code as well as a letter and three digits. And the idea is that um, someone um, could see that color band more readily and potentially read it. And so we don't necessarily have to capture that bird back to get that information. And so we have a couple different colors um, of uh, color bands that we used, and it's based on the state in which we're banding. So Alabama, we use blue color bands. Um, Georgia, we use yellow color bands. Um, and uh, Florida, we use green. So that's just some examples of, of the colors we're using. And so the idea is, yeah, if someone sends us a picture of that, we could pretty quickly narrow down uh, where that bird came from. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Looks like we have a caller on the line. So we say good morning to Kathy, who calls us from Madison. You're on the air with us, Kathy. Go ahead. Good morning. Morning. Um, my sister lives down in Warrens County. She found a very young Mississippi kite down on the ground in her yard, and they got a basket, put it back in the tree, and uh, Mama's taking care of it. And I didn't know if that was something someone, Emma, may want to ban before it flies away or not. So... Yeah, that's a great question. So um, typically, you know, ultimately we ban to answer specific questions. Um, so, you know, there are people who are doing kite research. We currently are not. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. But, yeah, you typically, you know, again, it's highly regulated. Um, and, like, so, for instance, I currently don't have kites on my banning permit. So even if I wanted to ban one, I don't have a project, um, so I couldn't ban it. And so this is a commonality that you see because ultimately we want to ban with a purpose and um, a, a question that we're trying to, to get at. And so that might be something of interest to me if I was, for instance, doing a study on Mississippi kites. So I hope that answers your question. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that was I a guess. really good I question. All right. Thank All right. you so much. So much. All right, Kathy, thanks right, for, Kathy, your, phone thanks for your phone call. Uh, Anne is on the line from West Tennessee. Looks like she's got a question for Dr. Major. Go ahead, Anne. You're on the air with us. Thank you all so much, and thanks for being there. Um, we have a um, retired, well, we have two retired racing greyhounds, but um, the one I'm calling about today um, was born February 
14th, Valentine's Day, 2013. About a month ago, with his regular checkup, he was diagnosed with right rear leg CCL tear, which in humans is the ACL ligament in his knee. So he was doing pretty well and, and improving. We limited his exercise. Um, I mean, we don't take him on walks. We just take him out to relieve himself. And we've been doing all kinds of modalities. But um, all of a sudden, he started going rapidly downhill. And now his other leg, his left rear leg, is is having issues turning in and, and looking weak. He can't sleep at night the last two nights. Um, he's having, um, he can hardly walk. And he's in pain. We have him on some pain med. We're getting some more pain med. But I'm just wondering, any modality at all that we could try to ease his uh, discomfort and surgery is out of the option because of his age. And there you are. Okay. How long ago was the first uh, episode of when he actually tore his ACL? It was um, actually right before we went to his annual checkup uh, the first week of June. So it was a, a week or so before then. And then he kind of heard it <laughs> after that. You know, they don't realize that they have to slow down. And he has a little brother he plays with. So, yeah. Right. What you're doing, you're using pain medicine, uh, probably one of the non-steroidal uh, medications like uh, Remedil and or something. And then the vet today just, just ordered some, um, put us on Tramadol, and and yes. then we're supposed to see the vet Monday. But. Right. Uh, at his age and everything, he's not overweight, is he? Oh, gosh, no. He still okay, is good. looking Yes, he doesn't have good. an ounce of fat on Okay, so he's in good shape from that standpoint. There's some things that you can do. You tried your best from the standpoint of, one, restricting his activity, putting him on medication. Um, as far as the other things that can be done without doing surgery, um, it's possible you might be able to get a brace that would fit him. Uh, it would have to be fitted properly and it would give him some uh, support. It's not uncommon to see both rear legs uh, have issues. Number one, he's probably was bearing more weight on the opposite leg because of the ACL tear, and that is not uncommon for both sides to, I don't know if that one's torn or not, but certainly it could be weakened because of having to bear weight on that. Right. He's, um, he's actually doing, turning in that, that left leg, left one, he's really turning it in more now towards the inside right. rather than keeping it straight on alignment, this paw. Now, at 10 years old, uh, how about his mm-hmm. heart and everything? Is it general condition is good? Oh, it's, it's excellent. He gets very unremarkable checkups as far as issues. Right. So that they just been super healthy. Right. If he's in that good a shape, I still... Personally, would not rule out surgery as being an option. Uh, he needs the support. Mm-hmm. He's probably probably not going to get a lot better. He will have arthritis, which he already has. Uh, he's going to have some pain involved. Talk seriously with your vet about the potential of doing surgery. There are several procedures that may not be um, as extensive as others, but uh, discuss that with him and get a second opinion if you if you feel like you need to. I'm sure you trust your vet. That's not the issue, but you might want to get a second opinion to see if there are other options that can be done, okay? Okay, well, thank you so much for your time and information, and we just love your, your show, the, the wildlife and the um, domestic um, critters, so thanks again. Well, we appreciate your question, and certainly uh, best of uh, luck, and hopefully you can find a solution that will help this dog. Sounds like he's a great dog. You take care. All right. uh, Thanks, Ann, for both the question and the kind words about our show. We appreciate that. And thanks for calling in this morning. This is Creature Comforts, where we've been visiting this hour with Emma Rhodes with the Banding Coalition of the Americas. So, Emma, you've mentioned a couple of times that this is kind of a highly um, regulated uh, activity, bird banding. And so 
when it comes to determining which birds that you will ban, does it usually go along with some entity that's interested in some sort of study about that type of bird? Right. And so, like, for instance, with us, we are interested in, right now we're mainly focused on um, hummingbirds and songbirds. We have expanded out to some raptor research. So ultimately, it you're looking at, you know, what can you essentially contribute um, to the knowledge of, uh, of birds, trying to answer a question or questions that we don't know. Or so for instance, banding it, a lot of times is used for species of high concern to actively manage and try to increase um, their populations. And so it really depends on uh, what you're trying to, to get at and uh, the questions you're interested in and uh, the species that, you know, essentially need um, the most help sometimes. So uh, how do you go about uh, catching the birds to put the band on them? So there's different methods um, depending on uh, the birds that you're trying to target. So with songbirds, we use something called mist nets, M-I-S-T. And the net almost feels like hair net, uh, ha- hair net material. And we stretch these throughout the habitat using conduit poles. And um, this is how we can passively survey birds. And we use this a lot at our our migration stations. Um, And if you're interested in in more information about that, we actually run public bird banding um, along um, the Alabama coast. And you can, uh, and we also have a couple different events where we demonstrate banding to the public. Um, you know, and our events are, are free. Uh, sometimes, depending on where we're banding, there might be an interest in, um, an entrance fee to that site. Um, but, um, yeah, we'd love to see you out. Um, our next upcoming public banding event is um, in September at uh, Fort Morgan, Alabama. And it runs um, for um, eight days. And you can come at and see us in action banding the birds and learning more about the process. All right, so if someone is interested in in maybe attending something like that or just finding out more information about the Banding Coalition of the Americas, do you have a website? Yeah, so go to bandingcoalition.org. Again, that's banding, B-A-N-D-I-N-G, coalition.org. That is going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio with funding and provided in part by listeners. Today's show was produced by Java Chapman and our call screener was Abram Nanny. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Emma Rhodes, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.